know, throughout the night, I've had a, a number of young people say to me and stop me and say, you really need to talk to us and you really need to get our voice heard. And I said, you are absolutely right. And so we have a portion of a, an interview we did with some of the gang members um, who were attending the uh, meeting tonight with church leaders. And here's some of what they had to say. Magic, I see you. Bimo, what up? Here's your opportunity to tell me what's going on. Now, we, just want, we want to tell the people of the city right now in Baltimore City that the image that they're trying to portray of the gangs in Baltimore, the BGF, the Bloods, the Crips, we did not make that truce to harm cops. We did not come together against the cops. We're not about to allow y'all to paint this picture of us. We got we got soldiers out here right now. We dirty. You know, we dirty. They threw bombs at us for trying to stop what's going on right now. Y'all not about to do that to us. So your game plan tonight has been to stop the violence. To stop what's going on. That's all we that's all we trying to do. We just want we want justice for Freddie Gray. We believe in that. Try to clip our wings, we not flying yet. Can't wear my shoes without tying it. Can't fit my clothes without trying it. President called us thugs, they not hiding it. It's a war on drugs and they buying it. I'm Eric Gardner, I'm Freddie Gray. I'm Trayvon Moore, and that's every day. This can't be life, we gotta get away. All right, so I'm, oh, I'm Orlando Gilliard. Um, I'm from Baltimore City. Grew up in Baltimore all my life. Um, I do music, I'm an artist. I work with the community. Um, I'm involved in a program right now called Civic Works, where we we take a lot of guys off the streets, a lot of guys that have records and things like that, and we teach them how to um, do roofing, do solar, um, do some construction, do weatherization. So a lot of the guys that probably wouldn't have been able to get those jobs um, in any other circumstance, we help them navigate that and get them placed at um, different companies and things like that. So, um, yeah, that's me. Um, Basically, just to just to backtrack, how I how I got involved in a lifestyle just in general was, um, I was in high school, maybe like sixteen or seventeen years old, and um, it was just becoming a big thing in 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 my city. It was just becoming a big thing, like gang culture was just becoming a big thing in my city, probably like two thousand three, two thousand four, two thousand five, and stuff like that. So, um, a lot of my friends was already involved in it. My my father was incarcerated, and um, it was very um, heavy in the, in the Maryland state system. So um, I knew that he was a part of it, and I just wanted to be I wanted to be like my dad. You know, my dad and my mom had me very young, um, six fifteen and sixteen years old. So it's like we kind of grew up together. You know what I'm saying? It was you know kids raising me. So um, uh, and my dad took you know took a a turn in his life and um, got involved in. You know what I'm saying? The street gangs and things like that. And I always looked up to my dad. So I wanted to do whatever he he did, you know, so I was partial towards that anyway. So, um, yeah, I got introduced to the lifestyle in um, 16 or 17. Um, years passed, doing everything under the sun that came with it, uh, you know, a lot of negative things. And um, I wound up going to federal prison in 2000 and, um, 2008. Um still going through the same process in prison you know it's very political in prison very geographical so um the gang stuck together you know the bloods the cribs you had the bgf you had the mexican mafia and things like that so everybody had their um little political cards in um federal prison so uh, i came home in 2013 um i definitely did a lot of reading up and studying and things like that while i was in prison i knew i didn't want to come home and make the same mistakes again so um, I came home and I started, you know, taking music more serious because that was always my passion anyway. So I started taking music more serious, started shooting music videos and things like that. And then um, in 2015, a Freddie Gray um, incident happened. And I already knew that, you know, from over the years of just being involved in, in gang culture, I had um, a certain reputation in, in my neighborhood and with a lot of guys from the different street organizations. And one of my best friends, um, Gary Johnson, he lived in a neighborhood um, that was like predominantly Crips and uh, BGF. So he had um, he had a he had a pretty good reputation with those guys over there. Even though he's not from any specific gang, he had a lot of um, he had a good rapport with those guys over there. And, and we went to school with him over the years. So it's like we knew each other, you know, cordially. 
Um, so when the Freddie Gray incident happened, uh, I DM Gary, I DM Gary Johnson and, and was like, you know, what would you think about um, us doing a truce? I feel like this is a good time, you know, to show unity um, and to go back to the roots of things, which it was, you know, protecting our community from situations like this. So he was like, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to make a few calls on my end and we're going to go to, you know, City Hall and we're going to come out um, and, you know, show our face and show uh, camaraderie with each other. So that's what we did. He called a few guys from his side. I called a few big guys from my side. We got everybody to come out and meet up down City Hall, and we just started moving from there. And um, unfortunately, around that time, that's when the uprising really kicked off and the looting and the fires and everything else was going on. So while we were going around, you know, trying to protect stores and everything like that from being looted and burned, um, we winded up seeing um, a lady from – a news station, I want to say it was Fox 45 or Channel 11. And um, she saw us and she wanted to speak to us about, you know, what was going on, what, what was our role in the riots and everything like that. And the first interview we did with her, that's the one that went um, viral, like a, millions of people saw that. And it brought light to, you know, our situation um, in Baltimore. And from there, I started getting more interviews, BT, Hot 97. Um, a bunch of local um, interviews in New York City and things like that. And it just started to spread from there. Different cities started to pick up the ball with the truce. Um, Philadelphia, states down south, even California was, you know, showing pictures of unity um, amongst gangs and stuff like that. So it was a very pivotal moment um, for me and for the city. Yeah, and, you know, here we are now. Yeah, so we knew, we knew, we already knew that, because um, originally, the police put out a report saying that the gangs were um, uniting to combat, the, to um, basically start a war with the police. So in that first interview we did, we we debunked that and we let them know that that wasn't the case. Um, they had a curfew out already. So we, we knew that they were looking for any reason, you know what I'm saying, to try to uh, paint a picture that we were out there doing something negative. So we made sure that people were doing what they had to do and at the same time, getting their voices heard um, by protesting and things like that. And on Pennsylvania Avenue, for one, um, for for instance, it was a lot of camera activity. A lot it was CNN and a lot of different other news media outlets down there. And there were people still breaking in stores and everything while this was going on. So um, we definitely wanted to protect those stores, especially since they were shining a light on the city right there with all those cameras. We wanted to um, put our best foot forward and make sure that we were. Um, protesting the right way and getting our voice heard. Um, it came up very quick. We met at like a we met we met at like a small McDonald's first on um, Martin Luther King Boulevard. That's when it was kind of small. It still was kind of small. It probably was about twenty or thirty of us out there. But um, as the day went on and we started actually walking towards City Hall, more and more people started showing up. And before we knew it, it was hundreds you know, hundreds of us there. So when we went to City Hall, it was just a lot of people taking pictures and stuff like that that was going viral because we were taking pictures with like um, members of the Nation of Islam, members of the Christian Church. And then from there, like Snoop Dogg and people like that started like reposting their pictures and they just started going viral and just bringing more attention to the situation, which is, that's what we wanted. Honestly, I wasn't expecting the, um, the church organizations that really get involved in the Nation of Islam. Well, I can't really say that I, that I, was too surprised about the Nation of Islam because the Nation of Islam is very hands-on with uh, the community. They in the uh, the roughest of the roughest neighborhoods, um, you know, giving out the words, speaking about God, speaking about you know young kids changing their lives, and they meet you where you are. Like they don't, they're not real preachy. So um, I wasn't too surprised about them, but um, when the Christian churches started getting on board with everything and calling us in for um, church services and stuff like that letting us speak that's when I knew like um this is this is becoming a big thing well we've always been the closest with um the nation of Islam I will say that um out of all the religious groups um the nation of Islam is the one who we probably kept in contact with the longest I see those guys all the time I know a lot of their faces um and every time I see them in passing I try to support whatever they're doing whether they're um handing out the uh the daily call um, newspaper that they, ha they, they that they hand out when you see them outside. Uh, we pull up on them and we talk and things like that. And um, we just try to keep the relationships flowing. I saw Kwame, I just saw Kwame Rose uh, 
a couple of days ago. I, I, just, I haven't seen Kwame in a minute, um, but I, I wound up seeing him a couple of days ago. And we had a nice little talk reminiscing about what was going on. Also, uh, Lamontre Randall, one of the guys that was real pivotal in um, the uprising, um, he works with Civic Works as well. So he brings guys over and, you know, shows them the ropes and gets them into construction and things like that. So, yeah, man. Um, uh, as far as the tr- as far as the truce, um, it definitely hasn't been any you know blood on crip violence. You know that's a, I'm pretty sure there's small little instances and things like that that it's kind of hard to control because you know you can't keep an eye on everything. But as far as as a whole, like we're not at war with um any I- any other gang or anything like that. It's just been um us trying to find new ways to get guys employed. Um, the guy who actually started the truce with me, he has a um. He owns. He has a business. He has a lawn care service. Um, and he employs guys, and like I say, I work with a with a program that employs a lot of guys and teach teaches them trades and stuff like that. So you know, just because they did weren't able to go out and get um a degree and things like that, they can still learn a trade where they can use their hands. And, you know, hopefully one day start their own business and, and employ other guys like that. So um, we just partnered with a few people and did a uh, back to school drive last week. Uh, got some kids, some book bags, and some school supplies and stuff um, to get back to school on that first day because it started uh, earlier this week, Monday, that just passed. Um, so it's just doing things like that for the moon, uh, the community, just trying to give back in every way that we can, every way that um, when we were growing up, it, was, it wasn't really a lot of these outlets and stuff like that. So we're just trying to give back in the best way we know how, you know. Yeah, so just trying to find a way to do things the right way. I understand that... Um, and I learned that from the uprising that happened when you come out, just, you know, even though we weren't coming out with a violent stance, when you come out and um, you already have a stigma against you for something and then you come out and try to make a change, they try to target you in any little way. So we just try to make sure that we do things. Um, we try to beat them at their own game. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, so that's where we're at now with it. Um, it's still, it's a, I feel like it's a heavy police present, uh, police presence here. Um, I wouldn't say it's as bad as when the uprising will have, uh, were going on because I feel like, um, a lot of guys were being targeted at that time, uh, quiet as kept, but I feel like it's a heavy police presence now. I haven't been seeing too many instances of police brutality. I know the last, uh, officer involved shooting that I know about happened in June is where they, shot and killed a guy but he um pulled a weapon on him so they uh unfortunately shot and, and killed him but other than that as far as like freddie gray ask situations um i haven't seen that over the last few years mm-hmm. so hopefully um what happened on the uprisings you know encourage those guys in the police department to handle things a different way when they're um policing our communities mm-hmm. uh personal issues and impacts okay well from a negative side, um, around the time that the uprising happened, I was working for um, a college in Baltimore. I'm not going to say what college it is because I did file a law. I, I did file suit against them. But um, when they caught wind of the first interview that we did with um, the news station in Baltimore, they fired me for that. And uh, a lot of the kids on the campus, they started recognizing me from that um, interview. So they used to come up to me and want to talk to me and want to interview me and things like that. So when they found that out, they found out I would get fired and they signed a petition. It was like hundreds of um, signatures basically saying that this isn't this isn't right. He shouldn't be getting fired just for speaking out um, and things like that. But unfortunately, they still winded up uh, letting me go. Um, I got a lawyer on top of it and we settled out. We winded up selling it out. So that was a negative impact it had um, because What's crazy about it is uh, my supervisor at the time pulled me up and was like, man, I really like how you how you spoke for yourself on national national television. You know, you really surprised me with that. Um, And I'm like, you know what? Thank you. Like they pulled me in the office 10 minutes later and fired me. So it's like (laughs) so that was one of the that was one of the weird things. And which made me realize, like, it's all about politics in a lot of these cases, like. Yeah, he may have liked me personally, but the campus didn't want um, that type of representation. So I understood it in a way, but at the same time, it was like, man, this, this is my livelihood at the time. Um, 
but things wound up getting better. I wound up landing new gigs. I wound up being on BT and everything started rolling out from there. So everything happens for a reason. So on a positive side, um, I just know that with any change, you got to make sacrifices. Sometimes that's, you know, sometimes that's um, losing a job, losing out on money, sacrificing time with your, uh, with your family or stuff like that, just to be outside, getting your voice heard and getting things done in the community. Um, so you got to put in a lot of blood, sweat and tears for this. So in the end, it all paid off. I feel like it definitely had a positive impact on my life because that's history. At When I look, I mean, at the time, I didn't realize we were making history. But when I look back on it um, almost 10 years later, it's like we made history. There's something I could tell my son about. There's something I could tell my daughter about that happened, you know, that, that their dad did and was a part of. Absolutely, because we already been there and done that. So we know how to get it done again. Yeah. You know, and we probably would get it done more efficiently this time because we're older, more mature. Um, we learned from the mistakes we made the first time, you know. So yeah, that's all a learning experience. Yeah. Um, not specifically, not no specific project right now, but like I said, I work at a program called Civic Works. And then if anybody wants to get involved, you can just go online. We got a lot of open houses. We have growing farms. We, we we grow fresh fruit and vegetables and stuff and take it out to the community. We get the communities air conditioners. We help them get appliances and stuff like that for their homes. And like I said, we teach guys trades and things like that. That's something I'm working on every single day, Monday through Friday. You know, the only days we're off is the weekend. So um, if anybody wants to get involved, uh, you know, and get involved with that, they can just go on civicworks.com and look for the next open house and see how they can be involved. We have a lot of partners. We get a lot of funding from different sources and things like that. So uh, we're just looking forward to putting new guys on and teaching them a trade. And, you know, making our community better, making our community safer. Um, just doing the best we can do. They said we couldn't do it, but we did it. They said we couldn't do it, but we did it. They said we couldn't stick together, but we did it. Sometimes you got to make noise for them to listen. They said we couldn't do it, but we did it. They said we couldn't do it. But we did it. They said we couldn't stick together, but we did it. Sometimes you gotta make noise for them to listen. No peace, no racism, no justice, no peace, no racism.